So I'm Doug. Oh. That was the quickest talk I've ever given in my career. <laughs> um, I'm Doug, and uh, hi, I'm Jason. Jason, and we're going to hear talk about learning to rank uh, that we have been working on together in the context of job search and uh, as a functionality we're adding to as a plug into Elasticsearch. And it's not only that, but the pain points in the sort of uh, bruises that we earned along the way. Space. Space. Uh oh. It's the first lesson we learned about <laughs> learning to rank was. Uh oh. We probably should have tested this, huh? <laughs> it was working. There we uh, go. Uh, so, we're, we're engineers, it's okay. Yeah. I watched someone very smart yesterday spend about an hour trying to print badges. <laughs> so, and if you know what's happening tomorrow in terms of a conference, you'll know who I'm talking about. Uh, uh, so I work at Open Source Connections. I, our company focuses pretty exclusively on solar and elastic search relevance problems. So ranking, uh, how I like to tell people that don't know anything about search, I try to match users to your products find the best products for them, whether it's through search or recommendation systems. Uh, and Jason. So I work at a company called Snag a Job. And I put this slide up here for context, not to hit you over the head with marketing stuff. But uh, probably none of you have heard of our company. I'm going to take a guess. Uh, but we are the largest marketplace for hourly work in the United States. And so some of the statistics up there, we have four and a half million applications, people applying to, for jobs on our platform a month. Uh, 5.3 million people were hired last year on our platform. We get about a million new workers uh, every month. Uh, and about 75 million uh, registered, I believe that's around 80 million now, uh, on the platform and around 300,000 employers on the other side. There is. Making, I'm making funny noises, sorry. All right. So I'm going to try to explain our problem to frame it up uh, just with some, some examples here. And now, so don't get in trouble. We have good searches on our platform, but I'm going to show you some really bad ones. <laughs> so here's a query for McDonald's in Anaheim, California. That's just outside of Los Angeles. OK, uh, the first three results are OK, but what happened here? Uh, I've returned two Starbucks results in the top five. Why is that? Well, we're boosting on title. We're saying that the title is the most important thing in this particular case, but we also are boosting on things that are uh, fresh. We have a belief that uh, if a job is new, it's more likely that people will apply and get hired to it. But in this case, uh, the English analyzer has done a nice match for us on the title of McDonald Avenue in Westminster, California, which is giving us a pretty poor result. So let's go to Compton, California, and this result gets way worse. Starbucks is my first result. The reason for that is because that zip code doesn't have any open positions. So those things get boosted right to the top. Let's go across the country to New York City. This is Carroll Gardens. It's the same query. So you can see here the first three results, all five McDonald's. It's relatively high recall. Those are 15 to 20 miles away. OK. It still seems like it could work, except in this particular geography, that's really bad. If you've been to New York City, no one's going to do this. That's about 46 miles away. It'd probably take you two hours, or you could probably get a canoe across the Hudson Bay. Uh, There's no water taxi. Yeah, it's not, not good. So this makes us sad. Let's look at some data. So this is a distribution of keywords on our platform over the course of a week. You'll notice here that we're lucky when we get a brand. So those queries that I just gave right there, that I gave an example of, aren't even very common. What's more common is that people are saying, I want a part-time job, I want a full-time job. And the problem with that is, is that that matches almost every document that we have in our index. So yes, we can filter down by location, but here's an example of this. So this is a search, that same search for part-time here. And the first three results are special skills that I don't have. So this search is extremely not personalized to me. This is the real problem we have. Hand-tune relevance, 
the vector space model, BM25, etc., doesn't work for us. So field boosts are extremely complicated. They're difficult to maintain. We have tons of rules. When you fix one, it creates a problem somewhere else. When you fix that somewhere else, it creates a problem in places that we don't know until we've delivered bad results to our workers, and that's something that we don't want to do. Geography plays a very important factor in relevance. So just like you saw in New York City, that same 40-mile commute could be okay if you're in a smaller or a, a smaller metropolitan area. Humans are complicated. Trying to create heuristics around psychology and human behavior is an incredibly hard thing to do. So this is where we decided that learning to rank was something that we were interested in doing. We saw the talk from Bloomberg, uh, at Lucene Revolution, got inspired by that, and then decided that we're a data-driven company to begin with. We want to use our data to drive our user relevance. So we partnered with Doug and Open Source Connections to implement Learning to Rank in production to completely rebuild our whole search experience. So now I'll kick it over to Doug to yeah, go. Yeah, sure. <coughs> so that kind of frames the picture. And I want to talk more about Learning to Rank in general, not just in terms of uh, job search. But often when you're doing these relevance problems, you might start out uh, trying to gather a sense of correctness for your search. So in this case, we're switching to movie search, and we've got Rambo, a bunch of Rambo searches, and we've decided to grade them. And grade here, and usually in search, you know, you have four means it's an exact perfect match, zero means it's a horrible match. So we've got Rambo as a great match for the keyword search Rambo, obviously. First daughter is an absolute terrible result for Rambo. Uh, same with Rocky. <clears throat> and this sort of forms the basis of how people might often tune relevance. Um, I call this test-driven relevancy, where you have some correctness data. In some cases, you might just have as little as 50 queries. You might have thousands of queries. And as you're testing and manually tuning search results, you're getting a sense of, OK, when I tweaked this title boost, Rambo got better, but Rocky got worse. And you can get a sense as you're iterating on search how whether or not you're going in the right direction as a developer, as you're hand tuning. So learning to rank differs because instead of focusing on tuning, hand tuning this uh, search engine, you're focused on a model. You're using the same kind of data as a training set for building a uh, machine learning model that can rank results for you. And instead of iterating offline on a, on a maybe tweaking boost and whatnot, you're really getting at, um, you're playing with a model, separating training and test data if you've ever done any machine learning work, training a model, testing it out to see how accurate it is. And the value, as Jason kind of said for you, is learning to rank, I think, is really valuable, especially when you get into tree-based and SVM-based models on capturing a lot of context. Uh, linear base where you're just tweaking the weights on boosts uh, often can't get the, at the context of in this geography, this certain skill, your workers have this certain skill more or this certain distance matters more or less because of uh, how difficult the commute is. So you really get at these sort of contextual situations that are really dependent on where you are. So learning to rank with Elasticsearch is basically baking that model that you trained into the search engine. So you take the uh, brains that you just trained, maybe you feel like it's pretty accurate. And if you saw the Bloomberg talk, you, basic, you saw them do this in a demo with Solar. But you take that model and you give it to the search engine. And you put it in there and you you have a baseline ranking function. Maybe you retrieve, uh, just do simple TF-IDF scoring on a couple fields, it's a little bit of hand tuning. And then you use your model to rescore the top end search results. Uh, Elasticsearch and Solar both have rescoring capabilities or re-ranking capabilities that let you execute a query on a window of your top search results, and it gives it a chance to shuffle things up to the top based on the contextual clues of, say, geography, personalization, all kinds of uh, signals that you can use during ranking. So, ah, I was going to fix that. That says judgment list to training set. Um, how learning to rank works in Elasticsearch, very briefly, is 
our plugin, we start with this CSV file that maybe we hand generated, maybe it came from analytics, maybe our domain experts told us about it. And we use this to go off and gather relevance scores for features we hypothesize correlate with relevance. Now, just like in the Solar plugin, features correspond here to uh, a Elasticsearch query. So here, this is a simple feature that's the TFIDF score of the title field for the keywords. And you can see here, and this is a file format that's a sort of canonical way of doing these training sets for relevance. We've given all our queries an ID. We don't need the document ID anymore. We left the grade in the left column. So Rambo is query ID 1, Rocky is query ID 2. And we've started to fill in different features we hypothesize might correspond to relevance. Based on us going to Elasticsearch and saying, hey, can you take this document, do a title, run this query on it, and give me the score? Can you run this, uh, take this document, run this other query? And you can, the, with the Elasticsearch query DSL, you, can, you're, the creative, you have no bounds on your creativity. You can go and use all kinds of query primitives to build up your, your features that you might think are important. Now, we, how the Elasticsearch query DSL, or Elasticsearch Learning to Rank plugin works, it integrates with uh, RankLib, which is an academic uh, developed uh, learning to rank system uh, library. And what it does basically is takes these RankLib models and can evaluate them. And here, we've taken our training set on the left, and ranklib can just be run at the command line, java-jar ranklib with a bunch of command line parameters, and we've trained a model. We've spit out a model. And in this case, it's an ensemble of decision trees, uh, a model, uh, model known as Lambda Mart. And you can see here that in this case, decision trees are actually really good at getting at different context. Because if you could say, if in New York, if the distance is this, look, double check the commute distance, uh, do all these other things. And there's no way you, as a hand tuning person, could do that without an extensive amount of ridiculous number of rules. So you can see here that we have the first two levels of this decision tree are feature two, which was our body score. Uh, and it's basically go left if it's less than that threshold. And then eventually we get to a title score and we have a threshold of zero and it'll output a score negative two, uh, interestingly, in both cases, which is sometimes a fun part of machine learning models. So what does the Elasticsearch Learning to Rank plugin do? The first thing it does is it accepts these models basically using Elasticsearch's scripting functionality, and that has a lot of nice features like not having to, us to have to think about clustering or anything. Scripts automatically get distributed around the cluster. They get cached. Uh, and you can store them on the file system, you can post them, you can even inline them, which is for anything that's non-trivial you probably don't want to do in your query. And I can give it a name. So here I've got a scripting uh, plugin called ranklib that the plugin has added, and I'm sending that script I just showed you up to uh, ranklib. And you do need to crank up the setting on Elasticsearch for the maximum size of a script. So once you have a model, the other thing the plugin does is it gives you a model. You can tell it the model you want to execute, in this case, Doug's model that we just created. And you restate the features that you are using. So feature one, unfortunately, ranklib thinks in one-based indexing. Uh, and feature two, go in the features list. And then you're just telling it which model to execute. The nice thing about this being a part of the query DSL is you can wrap it in business rules or do all kinds of stuff. You have a lot of freedom. You can f add filters. You can make it part of your solution. Potentially, you could execute two or three learning to rank models if you wanted to, sort of like open to your creativity. But of course, you ought to do, use this in the context of rescoring. So we don't actually enforce in this plugin that you do rescoring. Uh, in fact, our company's blog is done in Learning to Rank, and I don't do any rescoring because there's about seven or 800 blog posts, and I don't worry about that, and it works pretty fast. In this case, we're actually narrowing it down to the top 500, and you can see with Elasticsearch, we're getting at that, uh, the same query I said below. And then up top, where I've got query, I've got my baseline relevance that I maybe have hand-tuned a little bit. So. I think what's interesting is uh, I see 
when people talk about learning to rank, I tend, generally see two solutions. One is people bake something into the search engine, and the other is maybe they have an API outside of the search engine where they prefetch like a bunch of results. And I really like the approach of baking it into the search engine, uh, even though it's you know you, it's more challenging potentially if you don't have a plugin to do this. The reason I like baking this into the search engine is performance uh, is one reason. You can sort of pre-filter. You don't have to prefetch a 1,000 results. Uh, and the second point is actually really important. You, uh, search engines are basically built to do these query-dependent features, these ranking signals to get at, like, to measure the TFIDF score of different titles. And it's really got this amazing, rich DSL already built in for ranking and sorting things that people are already using to build sophisticated search systems. Uh, and I already mentioned business rules, so we could layer business rules on top of this or figure out a way to do that with a query DSL. And finally, I think probably the thing that people take most for granted are just the dumb basic functionality that no one, no one pulls their hair out, out about, uh, that gets excited about. But you really still want facets, paging, grouping. You want to do all these things. You want to get autocomplete and spell checking and just get these bells and whistles that people expect from a search solution. Uh, and building something maybe outside to do your re-ranking, you're going to have to take all that into account. So I'm going to go through a bunch of lessons that we learned. So that was the, the happy path, everything is great. And yes, it was not that hard to get this to work for our blog. Uh, but when you go to a real production system that's not 800 blog posts, uh, like we did with Snagajob, we started learning lessons the hard way. So the first lesson I want to talk about is judgments are really hard to get. Uh, really good judgments are really hard to get. And I think people often don't take into account that the hard part about search is often measuring user behavior and measuring what good search is. Sometimes that's a lot more challenging than actually doing the whatever fancy relevance work you're going to do. It's easy to get excited about solutions. It's sometimes less exciting, to, less easy to get excited about, OK, was this good or bad, or how can we figure this out? And you know, there's a lot of ways we could define what good search is. That's a graphic from my book by Mr. Berryman, who is an Ink Inkscape pro. Um, and these, uh, you know, you might have the developers saying, you know, we have Sue in marketing, the CEO comes in, and my colleague Eric Pugh likes to refer to the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion. Uh, the CEO comes in and says, why is this broken? And you're like, well, it doesn't, we, no one ever searches for that. You know, people have pet peeve queries. There's a bazillion re ways you can go about getting this data. And there's really no one size fits all. And in my work doing relevance, I've seen this sort of roughly, and this isn't 100% like perfect dichotomy, but roughly the spectrum of search solutions on the left, which are very consumer facing, that are focused on analytics and have a lot of ability to get analytics, and search solutions on the right, which are more focused on knowledge management, where maybe there's 50 users and they're all doctors, and trying to get five of them in the room to tell you why search is broken is really hard. Uh, and on the left, you have you have problems of trying to figure out, like, OK, I've got all this analytics, but I can't go and talk to that person and ask them why they clicked on this thing. And so you're constantly looking at analytics, trying to get at why, why. Uh, on the right, with experts, you can at least go to someone and talk to them and get them to tell you why something was relevant or irrelevant. So you can get a better sense of how you should be constructing these judgment lists. Uh, and the, on the left, the, one, of the big, one of the big costs is really just infrastructure code for analytics. Like anyone who does a lot of really in-depth, like I know Snagajob, there's a lot of infrastructure to gather analytics about how people are interacting with search. Uh, on the right, of course, as I said, the cost is actually getting like a room, paying a doc, five doctors to sit in a room for you for a day, and then doing that every week until you get your search to where you want it to be. Yeah. So one big takeaway is there's a lot of non-technical domain expertise to do either of these situations. Even analytics, you sort of need to know your domain really well to understand why do hourly workers do certain things, for example, in Snagajob. So the other thing we learned is grade consistency. 
Like you really need a good standard when you're building judgment lists for when something is a four versus something is a three. And what you want to really avoid is having like relative grades. So if something is this, you, maybe on our blog, for example, and I think I have an example of that. We have someone searches for enterprise service bus. And the best thing we might have when you search for enterprise service bus is a bunch of old camel articles. Now, when I'm saying, what's my golden set for this query, it's easy to say, uh, I think I'll make that a four. That's the best I can do. But in reality, you sort of need to be really consistent on your criteria and be OK that you're going to have queries that the best thing might be a two out of four. You just might not have good content for that query. And to be really consistent, because you're going to train something that's a function of a bunch of features. So a four, really, it has to be a lot easier for your models to predict like when a four is a four and why a four is a four. So coming up with sort of consistent criteria, whether you're using domain expertise or you're gathering analytics, is, is really important for this kind of work. So I should just change the background of that like upper right thing. So what should you optimize for? <clears throat> and there's a bunch of search metrics that you, you can think about. Precision is sort of like the proportion of good stuff I have in end results. If uh, I have 100 fours and you show me the top 100 and they're all twos, that's a 50% precision, right? So that's a pretty rough metric. Doesn't necessarily take into account the position bias, you know? It's just a basket of twos and how, how far from good stuff is that? NDCG is a metric, not, it's called normalized discounted cumulative gain, and it's a metric that can tell you the distance your search is from a golden set. So if you take all those judgments and you get the ideal ordering, you get four, 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 three, 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 and you're showing sort of like a two, 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 four, two, three, it can give you a sense of how far, what's the delta between where you are and the best you could be doing. And the downside to that is if the best you have for a query is a two, your ideal ordering might be like two, 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 one. And if you do two, 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 one, you're still going to get a, a score of one in NDCG. These scores tend to go from zero to one. So something to take into account is you might be thinking the search result is perfect, but it's actually just saying that you're doing your best you can under the certain da under given data. So that's an area where that can be misleading. Uh, there's another statistic that I think is very useful that maybe if you've heard of NDCG, this is even a step more obscure. It's called Expected Reciprocal Rank, uh, ERR. And what this really does is just says, sort of gets at a sense of whether or not users can trust the results. So if I scan down, can I say this is a, do I get a bunch of fours or do I get a one and then a four? It has no concept of what the best is out there. And if you put a, it's really biased towards like, if the top, if the top one's really bad, you're going to have automatically a really bad ERR. So this just focuses on like, as users scan down results, are you pretty close to having uh, something that looks trustworthy and good? And this will actually stink if there is uh, a, you know, a two, and the best you have for the search result, search query is a two. You'll still get like a low ERR, and that'll kind of point at where NDCG uh, maybe doesn't tell, give you this information. So I, at Snagajob, actually, I think there's a balance of NDCG and ERR, which Jason will talk about. So of course, what should we optimize for? The answer is yes. So this is pretty domain specific. If if you're pretty focused on showing experts all of the information that is possible, sort of more, uh, more recall focus. You might, foc you might think about NDCG over a, a certain set. Uh, if you just care about whether or not results look good, which is often good in when people are building trust with the application, ERR is really important. So the other less painful lesson we learned is accuracy versus speed. It's really easy. Uh, we gave, the, at Snagajob, uh, data scientist Shun had got an extremely beefy EC2 machine. You can imagine getting a Spark cluster to do your training. It's easy to be on the left here with your, with your machine learning training infrastructure, where you've got the Death Star, and you're going to build the world's most accurate, perfect model with all the compute you have. 
But your search infrastructure is very different than that. When it executes models, it's sort of got to shoot all these little fighters out of the sky because it's got like very short amount of time to get rid of them all or else like the whole thing's going to crash down, right? So you have not a lot of time per search request to evaluate these models. So it was really important for us when we were doing this to sort of think through, okay, what's the right balance between accuracy and the performance actually in production? Uh, I, model selection, what kinds of models? I mean, there's rank SVM, there's gradient boosting, there's random forests of gradient boosted trees, there's linear models. Um, linear, mo the only, I think this matters a lot less than people think, if people get excited about models. I think once I have a model that most people, I think, once they get a family of models they're familiar with, they tend to worry more about sort of garbage in, garbage out, and tuning the hyperparameters of that model that in the way they're comfortable, rather than necessarily like having a, focusing too much on changing out different models. I do think one area where that's not true is, of course, linear models. Linear models are sort of like optimizing the boosts in your different queries. Uh, it, of course, like we said with, uh, with when Jason showed that example, it's hard to get an optimal sense of like in New York you get this, but in LA you get this. You're just going to get the average of New York and LA, and what you prefer is something that can get at context. You're going to get down to like, okay, if LA do this, if New York do this other thing, and so gradient boosting, rank SVM, those sorts of models can get at that, um, and. I think Grant talked about this yesterday, but one of the big things that I've sort of taken away from my learning to rank work is thinking about chaining models together, both in performance, so you know, a simple linear model to maybe to improve precision, and then maybe a slightly more complicated model to get NDCG over a larger set so that you're closer to your ideal ranking, and then maybe ERR over a very short set, even ERR at three or two or f four, to make the first page look trustworthy. And as you go from left to right, leftmost actually off the screen would be like your baseline ranking. You're getting even more sophisticated, even more complicated models that are slower, but doesn't matter because you're only doing a couple of results, even less each time. So uh, quality and accuracy. So this gets at a lot of different things, whether you're tuning model parameters, <coughs> or you're trying to figure out which features, aka Elasticsearch queries, actually matter in your case. And in the case of doing gradient boosting, it's hard to isolate to one feature and say, ah, this is the thing, this date boost is the thing that put us over the edge and made us that much better, made us, gave us 90% precision or something. The reason is, is like I said, showed before, Gradient boosting is a set of decision trees, and so things often depend on each other. It might be if you're in this position, if you're searching for movies, uh, if, you're, if there's a strong title match, maybe the recency of the movie, for example, is really important because we want to show you the latest movie in the Fast and Furious series, for example. But if you're searching for actors and you match on actors, maybe you're that doesn't matter as much, and you just kind of want a random set of movies and date doesn't matter. So getting at, the, at figuring out what combination of features helps you the most is actually more important. Um, and there's an algorithm called best subset selection, which sounds fancy, but it's really uh, you know, an extra for loop. And uh, my, I, I've just, my favorite saying is about every machine learning problem can be solved by just adding one more outer for loop by trying different hyper, just trying different stuff, more hyperparameters, and of course, Spark, AKA Spark jobs. <clears throat> so uh, before I jump to Jason really quickly, I, I wanna point out that I, in my opinion, this is actually harder than doing manual tuning. So I think you shouldn't necessarily think that you're doing learning to rank because it makes things easier. You have to do a lot more stuff on the right. Uh, on the left, we just kinda, Fairly simple setup. You might have some of the stuff on the right, like your user clickstream data, but you actually need a fair amount of stuff to do learning to rank well. You need data scientists. You still need your search engineers your, and your stake, business stakeholders. And you need to think about other problems, like how am I going to train my models? How am I going to get analytics? Or maybe user testing. 
but I think this can be a lot more powerful. So get into learning to rank because doing that is really going to be a game changer to your business. Uh, it, like it, 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 I think it's going to be for snag a job. So, and this is one thought I, I left you with, I want to leave with is because we're doing such heavily personalized learning to rank, we're often thinking about, can we just use learning to rank directly to do recommendation engines? The only difference between a search engine and a recommendation engine is really whether or not there's a keyword. They both rank things based on relevance. And when you're doing heavily personalized search, we might be at a point where we can say, here are your recommendations, and here are your search, all driven by one system. So that's one thing I'm personally excited about. So, so I just want to go over kind of how we went about implementing Learning to Rank so that everybody here can have kind of a tangible plan of how somebody has done it in the past or, or currently. We're going to hopefully be in production next week uh, and, uh, and, and kind of get some ideas from that as well as some lessons that we learned. So step zero, before you do anything, this is such an iterative process. You have to be OK to fail. We failed many, many times. First models did not perform well. Uh, when you do the initial looking at results, you have to trust your metrics. It's kind of a, 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 a kind of a mental shift from the way that we normally think of things uh, with search relevance. Step one, determine how to measure success. Doug went over these metrics. These are the two that we selected. Uh, as far as our cost function for our model training, we picked NDCG at 10. So we're actually optimizing for NDCG at 10. Uh, one interesting thing about this is that UX and UI actually have a big part in your metrics. So our mobile team is developing kind of a next generation application which does different groupings of jobs, which NDCG is basically a, posi a positional metric. And if you group things together, you could have interesting cases where people are getting the search result but not even seeing it. So something to definitely uh, think about. Uh, step two, this is super important. Your baseline ranking function is essentially your first query that you do to Elasticsearch or whatever search engine you're using. And this is your best guess at getting the top K before you pass it into the rescoring phase. Uh, so our example is we use the Gaussian decay for distance, for freshness. Uh, we also use VM25 similarity across different fields. And then we have a, a geo radius because most of our searches are, are geographical. Kind of what we found out is that the, the distance decay wasn't actually aggressive enough, and the same with the freshness decay. So what was happening was is bad results were getting into that top 1,000, and then it doesn't matter. Once bad results get in there, learning to rank won't help you. So uh, we also have some interesting edge cases with faceting. So we have location facets where a user could type in a location without a lot of context. They could type in Arlington, for instance. Well, there's an Arlington, Texas in the United States, and there's an Arlington, Virginia. Which one do they mean? Well, we have to assume that they mean both. So what that means is that you have the union of these two things, which now goes in, and that might be that you have 10,000 results that are relevant, but only 1,000 that can make it into that re-ranker. So you have to actually make decisions on what actually makes it into that top 1,000. So our current thinking is, is that we're going to let the baseline ranker handle recall and then optimize for precision in the, uh, in the actual rescore phase. Start small with your feature engineering. We picked five simple things. Each one of these, a brand similarity, zip code, title, job description, and a location are all text similarity fields. Each one of these features is an elastic search query. It each turns into uh, a, a particular uh, you know, score, which then that feature gets added into the model. And these things don't involve a lot of uh, complex feature engineering. Improve them constantly. You're going to always be iterating with your feature engineering. Features don't need to be searchy things. What I mean by that is they don't need to be similarity scores. Think about content profiles that could be learned via a content recommender system. They could be commute distance as a function of roads or transit. They could be market forces. We're largely in a marketplace, so we're subject to macroeconomic forces. We can model these as part of the, the function of the search engine and also the worker's query. Training models. We selected Lambda Mart. Uh, we have an infrastructure where we have a, a robust data infrastructure collecting user signals. So we get those user interactions, we turn them into judgments with Apache Spark, getting feature values from Elasticsearch. We then use the, the plugin from Open Source Connections to generate those models and then post them into Elasticsearch. This right now is a manual process. We're turning it into an automated process uh, orchestrated with uh, Apache Airflow. 
this is another thing that we're thinking about doing. You don't also need to just have your user signals turn into judgments. You can use things like latent factor models to actually add additional data to your, to your judgments. Here's some real-world considerations. Uh, Ranklib only runs on one machine. So originally, our data scientists were running it on their laptop. That gave a limit to the hyperparameter size that they could use. We could only use, I think, like 2.7 million judgments, the max tree depth of 20, uh, which has a limit to the precision of that model. We moved up to relatively large EC2 machines, but we're always going to be constrained by one machine. We have thought about using something like XGBoost, which is a parallel uh, gradient boosting uh, system, but uh, we uh, uh, haven't done that yet. So Doug talked about this. <laughs> I think it's important. We all know this, right? Right? Uh, if you have bad data, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter. You can have all the sunshine and unicorns. Uh, you're going to have garbage results. And so you need your data to be deduplicated. You need fraud controls. You need to be able to have clean user signals. And we've actually had to go back and correct some of this stuff uh, within our system because you, know, you can't model your way out of, a, out of a data problem. So this is one thing that uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about. But uh, query-dependent features are, are interesting in that you're training offline. And when they're evaluated at query time, the state of your index could change. So if you're using something like TFIDF, your scores will actually be different at training time and query time. So what we actually have talked about doing is logging query-dependent features as a training set. That's something also to, to think about. Uh, integrating with an existing platform, we have a system that works, drives money. So no, we don't want to integrate with it. We want to just build a parallel system. So what we're doing is we're building a completely parallel system putting it under A-B test to deploy it, and then we're able to tune and analyze the model until we are comfortable with the lift that we're getting in our core metrics. Last step, profit, hopefully. That's what, we've, what we want. So our version one of the model actually had lifts of about 20% in NDCG at 10, 37% in ERR at 10. This is our evaluation framework that we wrote, by the way, which takes a training test split, so it's not overfitting, don't worry. Uh, but, you know, we, real world cases, we'll see what happens. Uh, your hyperparameters matter. When we were able to train larger models, we got really large increases in our core search metrics, and this is uh, very promising for us. That's it. And yeah. uh, if you have any questions, I guess we don't have time, but there's also, some of you might know I wrote a book, and there's a discount code for you that I saved to the end. So, so you had to stay here the whole time to get a discount code. And if you're interested in the plugin, that's the URL. We're actually partnering both with Snagajob and the Wikimedia Foundation on 1.0 of the plugin, uh, which will be a lot more feature rich. And uh, if you're interested, check that out. So. Thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, so thank